Today we are able to kick off uh, the holidays with a special Honor Speaker Series speaker. Like the others that you have had the good fortune of hearing, today's speaker is socially and historically significant. And it is in all of our best interest to listen and learn and think and reflect about all that is before us. So if you would now join me in welcoming Christina Kinder, who will introduce our speaker. Christina. Today's speaker has not only been a role model for me, but for female soccer players everywhere. She is one of the most accomplished female soccer players in the world. She is perhaps best known as a retired captain and 17-year veteran of the U.S. Women's National Team. Among her numerous accomplishments, Julie is a two-time World Cup champion and Olympic gold medalist. A champion both on and off the field, she has been an outspoken advocate on behalf of gender equality in sports and was at the forefront of the Title IX policy debate. She distinguished herself as an outstanding student athlete at Stanford, completing a degree in biology while being named a four-time NCAA All-American. Her career on the national team began at the age of 16 in 1987. She went on to play with the USA when they captured the 1991 inaugural FIFA Women's World Cup in China, where she played every minute of every game. She was also co-captain of the 1999 team that captured the FIFA Women's World Cup in the USA. Foudy was inducted into the USA National Soccer Hall of Fame in 2007 alongside longtime teammate and friend Mia Hamm. Currently, she works as an ESPN personality for multiple studio programs. I am honored today to introduce today's speaker, Julie Fowdy. Oh, Christina, that was nice. Thank you, darling. Can I hire you to come around with me? Do you guys mind if I take this off? I don't do podiums very well. I'm going to take it off. How's that? Plus, when I get it uh, handheld like this, it makes me want to bust out singing, Summer Lovin'. No? Happy of Love. No? Anyone? Grease fans? Anyone? No. Uh, I am ecstatic to be here at Darlington School today. I am happy that you guys built this entire stage for me as well to speak. Uh, no, I actually got to watch the kindergarten kids this morning. I threatened to come out in the star costume. How cute was that? Were you guys all at the kindergarten performance this morning? Oh my gosh, that was awesome. Um, and I'm thrilled because we're actually coming back over the summer for our leadership academy for the first time. Chad Little, as you guys all know, who runs the soccer academy here, uh, has stalked me for six years about coming down to Darlington to bring our leadership academy down to Darlington. So I'm ecstatic because for the first time, we're going to do our summer camp here at Darlington, which is cool. So Chad, thank you for uh, being such a good friend and being so persistent with that. And I got an awesome tour this morning after the kindergarten play. Uh, and the one thing that kept coming back into my head is that college is going to be a little bit of a letdown for you guys. This place is nice. Seriously. You're going to get to college, you're going to be like, this is it, really? That's all you got for me? Um, but today I wanted to talk to you guys about something that's near and dear to my heart. And this is leadership. Um, because for, for a variety of reasons, when I was growing up, I grew up in Southern California and I played all different kinds of sports. I played soccer, of course, uh, as well. But one of the things I always thought of when I was growing up that leadership looked and felt a certain way. And there was a very narrow definition of leadership, right? And usually it looked like a man, you know, sitting on a horse with a tall hat and a sword. And, or it looked like a man that was in a position of power uh, as a president. And that was the images I had as a kid growing up. And it wasn't until I saw this quote, success isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice, that I had this epiphany. Unfortunately, I didn't see this quote until I was in college. But I was like, what? Why didn't someone tell me that? Success isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. Because you can swap out that word success with a lot of different words. And one of the ones I love to swap it out with, and this is something I learned by watching all these amazing women I played with on the US team. And, and mind you, you know, Mia and myself, Mia was 15 years old when we got on the women's team. I was 16. We were babies on that team. We grew up playing together for almost two decades on the US team. 
Uh, because back then they didn't even have youth national teams, so they shoved you on the full national team at an early age. But so I grew up for almost 20 years surrounding by, surrounded by not just amazing women on the field, but amazing women off the field with totally different leadership styles. And I looked at this and I said, leadership isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice, right? And, and think about that for a second. Because I think we grow up thinking, I have got to be a CEO. I need to be a celebrity. I need to be a star. I need to be, again, in a position of power to make an impact on someone's life. And yet I, lo I looked around at all these women I played with, and the thing I noticed that my definition of leadership was so narrow and so wrong that I could see Mia, who was one of the most impressive leaders I'd ever seen, and she did not ever want to do an interview. She didn't want to be in a photo shoot. She didn't want to be in the spotlight. She hated the spotlight. She would literally accept an award, and the first 15 minutes when she'd accept the award, now Mia is you know, arguably the best player to come through ever play in the game for women's soccer. She'd accept an award and spend 15 minutes thanking her teammates and the staff and the medical staff and the massage therapist and the trainer and the baker and the guy who delivered her mail and the parking attendant, and she'd go down the list, right? It was never about Mia. And she didn't ever feel comfortable with it being about her. And so what she learned is that my style is not going to be standing on top of the mountain shouting down. My style is not going to be standing in the middle of a huddle pounding my chest, getting the team excited. I don't want that attention. I'm going to lead in a very personal way. And I watched her in a very quiet, personal way do so many wonderful leadership moments, from grabbing Abby Wambach, if she was having a bad game on the side of the field, a young Abby Wambach. Abby came up just as Mia was leaving the national team. Or in the, in, in the locker room at halftime, grabbing someone quietly. But her style was very quiet. Contrast that with another player we had on the national team, Brandi Chastain. And you guys are too young to remember this, but there's a photo where she rips her shirt off and she's got her sports bra. That was the 99 World Cup, right? That was Brandi. She was full of life and she oozed passion and she was in the middle of the huddle pounding her chest. And that was Brandi style. And I would watch all these different players and think, ah, they're equally effective but in completely different ways and definitely not on a horse with a sword and a hat, right? But the hard part about it is figuring out the second part of that quote, which is, it's a choice, right? Leadership isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice, and raising your hand is hard. Raising your hand when you're not feeling very confident, or you don't feel like you have the skill set, or maybe, gosh, I haven't put enough hours into that. I'm, I'm just not, no, I'm not going to do it. I mean, how many times does something come up and you're like, oh, what am I thinking? I'm not doing that. I mean, we women, let's be honest, we're great at that. We have to go through like a checklist of like 50 things of, okay, I did this, I did this, I did this. Okay, yes, then maybe I'll raise my hand. And, uh, no, no, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm going to go back. We're great at that, right? So it's hard, I get it, it's hard. But one of the, the principles I have come to love and cherish in my life is one that Eleanor Roosevelt, you might have heard of her, said. Do you guys know this quote? Do one thing every day that scares you. One thing every day that scares you because you have to get out of that comfort zone and you have to feel good about that. So to help you guys out for today, how, how many of you done one thing today that has scared you? Anyone? Couple of you? Okay, good. Because I'm going to help you do your one thing right now. Ow! Britt, you're going to help me. Are you ready? Okay, so we do at our leadership academies, Brent, we do something we call laughing without smiling. Okay? So you're going to have to turn to a partner next to you. Okay, yeah, Brent, you can stand on the stage with me. I'll share the stage. Thanks. And now it's not easy. You have to turn to your partner, and Brent, I'll start, okay? And I'm going to do it first, and then you've got to do it back to me, and you have to judge who's won the competition, because it is a competition. I don't do anything without it being a competition, really. Okay, are you ready? You cannot smile. <laughs> okay, 
Okay, your turn. You get the mic for it. Okay. It's gotta be a good laugh. Warm it up, warm it up. Woo! <laughs> So thank you, Brent. Give him a round of applause. That was excellent. So turn to your partner. If you don't have a partner, do it in, in uh, threes. And it could be deep from the gut. It's got to be a laughter. You'll discover it is almost impossible to laugh without smiling. So turn to your partner now and laugh without smiling. Okay, one thing, one thing you may notice is that laughing without smiling is not easy, right? In fact, my, my eight-year-old daughter, when she does it, oh, she's now nine, my nine-year-old daughter, when she does it, she goes like this. That's how she starts, and then she launches in the... <laughs> So, and, and it's awkward, especially if you don't know that person next to you. You're like, I got to do this. I, I once did this with one of my ESPN colleagues, Jessica Mendoza, who does all the baseball commentary. And we did it on stage at a thing. And she turned to me and goes, and she goes, never do that in public ever, ever again. You look terrible. <laughs> I'm like, that's the beauty of it, right? And it's awkward. But once you do it, what did you find? You're laughing, you're having fun, it's not so hard. It's scary, yes, but not quite scary enough to check off your list. So where's Matt? Are you here, Matt? Oh, yes. Okay, Matt. We gotta give him scary, okay? And this one's gonna be a little tough in a chapel, but that's okay. I hope God's okay with this. All right, this is one we used to do on our national team all the time, right? Because we had all this downtime on the road, uh, in hallways, in locker rooms. And so we call this the best of your worst, your best worst. Meaning, you got to give me your best of your worst dance moves. Okay, we call it the B-dub. And again, it, it doesn't take long. I'm not talking like 30 seconds of your best worst because that would be painful to watch. I'm talking like I need five seconds. Do you want me to start first? I thought you were going to make me wear the star costume. I, I should have made you wear the star costume. Do you want me to start first? I'll stretch it out, Matt. Like Brent. Brent I should have had Brent do it because he was stretching it out. Are you ready? Is that all you got, Matt? What do you guys think? Is that out of his comfort zone? <laughs> Grabbing the shopping cart. Is that out of his comfort zone? Do you think he's got better in Matt? Yeah, come on. No, I'll show you, Matt. It's got to be like this. Hold the mic. I'd love to have Coach Guth and Mr. Evans up here so we could recreate our dance from the hallway. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, better. 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 It's got to be bad. It's got to be bad. Oh, bad. Okay. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. All right. So, 
Find a partner, turn the other way, change your partner up, you're gonna do it. Five seconds to each of you, pick a winner, your best worst, go on. I wanna see some shaking, go on and stand up. Go on, get out of that comfort zone. You must be standing to dance. Nice. <laughs> Who's this? Mr. Moss. Sam Moss. Yes. Perfect. All right, I would say about half of you got out of your comfort zone. The other half were like, this crazy woman on stage, what is she having me do? Okay, I will tell you the most impressive dancer out here, Mr. Sam Moss. Stand up, Mr. Moss. You want to demo it in, in you want to demo it on stage? Give him what you just showed me. That was amazing. Uh, you didn't show me, I saw it. Your move. <laughs> I don't even know Sam and I love Sam. All right, and, and here's why it's important to do one thing every day that scares you, right? Because of this, one of my favorite illustrations ever. There is your comfort zone, and what happens outside of your comfort zone? The magic happens, right? And you cannot get there unless you choose to get there. You raise your hand. And getting out of your comfort zone is hard, like we talked about. I get it, right? But unless you get there, you're never going to know what's outside that world. And I will tell you from experience, when I first got on the national team, there was no Women's World Cup. How many of you guys saw the U.S. women's soccer team win a World Cup in 2015? Right? They won the World Cup in 2015 and also the Olympics in 2012, the prior Olympics. When we got on the national team, there was no Women's World Cup, no women's soccer in the Olympics, and we as young, feisty teenagers were like, why not? Why isn't there women's soccer at a national level at the Olympics, international level at the Olympics, and at the world level with the World Cup? And people would say to us, that, that's crazy. That dream is crazy. There's not enough girls that play. There's not enough girls that are interested in playing. And we'd say, what? I, we don't think we're crazy. And every time we'd, we'd push it, we'd push it. Why can't we have a women's World Cup? And why can't we have it in big stadiums? Why can't we be in the Olympics? They would turn to us and say, we're crazy. That dream's crazy. Well, we could have believed that we were crazy, but we didn't, thankfully. What we did is we said, no, actually, we're not crazy. We're courageous, right? We went to fight and to push and get out of our comfort zone because these are adults. These are experts, quote, unquote, experts in the field telling us we were crazy. We said, we don't think we're crazy. We're, we care so much about this dream that we're willing to get out of this comfort zone and go find it on the other side, what, what's out there. We have our first World Cup in 1991. And a lot of you, and no one even knows this still to this day, it's the best kept secret, right? And th the other thing they told us is the U.S. will never win a World Cup, right? Foot soccer's not our sport. Football, like American football is our sport. And I get that in the South. That's, that's like religion down here, right? It's a good thing we're in a chapel for it. So we said, no, we're actually quite good. The first World Cup we had in 1991 for the women. Do you know who won it? Who? Come on. The United States of America. How dare you doubt us? Right? First Olympics. Happened in 1996. Do you know who hosted the 1996 Olympics? Atlanta. First time women's soccer was in the Olympics. Do you know who won that? Who? Go on.
Everyone shout it out, USA! So we won the 96 Olympics here in Atlanta, the first ever Women's World Cup, and we weren't done. We said, we're going to keep dreaming. Why don't we host a World Cup here in the United States in 1999? And they're like, okay, but let's keep it on the East Coast, keep it small, keep it safe. Don't put it in big stadiums, because what happens if people don't show up? That would be super embarrassing. They're not going to, you know, they're going to have empty stadiums on all these nationally televised TV games? And we said, well, what happens if people do show up? And we're in small stadiums in the East Coast, and we've never dreamed bigger than that. Then we don't know what's possible. We said, no, stop telling us we're crazy. We're courageous. Let's go big. If we're going to do a World Cup, let's do it in big stadiums all over the country. Let's not just do it on the East Coast or just on the West Coast. So we convinced our federation, and more importantly, FIFA, to do a big World Cup in the United States in 90,000 seat stadiums. Mind you, our biggest crowd in the US before the Olympics, because we had huge crowds at the Olympics, you know, maybe 10,000. We didn't know what was going to happen. This was a huge leap of faith, but we believed and cared so deeply about something that we said, that's not good enough. That's not the standard we want to set. We want to be bigger and better and show the world what's possible. So we literally spent three years, literally we joked, almost going door to door trying to sell this World Cup to put, quote, butts in the seats, right? We're going to get butts in the seats. We got to get people to come out to the game. And we, we promoted it, and we did autographs and clinics and all these things, but we still didn't know. In fact, at one press conference about the size of this, six months before the World Cup, and imagine a, like a, a wall of cameras along the back wall, and there was... Um, one reporter from America, I won't tell you his name, and he raises his hand. It's the very first question. There's all this great energy in the room and positivity. And he raises his hand and he goes, you guys are lying about ticket sales. No one's going to show up. You know, you're making this about more than just soccer. It's about girls and women power. You know, and, and this, is, this is really an embarrassment to the game when no one's going to show up at these stadiums. Well, literally, I started like pitting out, like sweating, right? <laughs> and I'm like, he could be right. But we, I just turned to Carla over back the other captain, and I was like, just smile, just smile. We smiled, and we said, well, Jamie Trecker was his name. Well, Jamie Trecker, <laughs> how, you know, we don't know that. Six months is a long time, and we believe that people are going to show up. We believe people are going to come to the stadiums. You may not believe it, but we believe it. And we think there's enough people that care about this event and enough girls that play soccer, enough boys that play soccer that they're going to want to come out and see it. So we drive now, fast forward, the first is at Giant Stadium up in New York, New Jersey area. And we're on the turnpike going up to the game. And, you know, it's a Saturday. It's hours and hours before. It's our very first World Cup game. And there is a full-on traffic jam. We cannot move. The bus is, like, stationary. And we're going... What is going on here? This is crazy. It's a Saturday. We're not going to make it to the, to the stadium. And then we start looking around, and we notice the cars. And the cars have, like, Go USA on them. We love Mia Hamm. And then people, like, started noticing that the bus was ours, and all the kids in the cars, like, Mia! And we realized we were the reason for the traffic jam. There were that many people coming to the game, and when we get to the stadium, when we walk out, and it's straight out of like one of those documentaries where it's like dark tunnel, lights come out, you walk out onto the field, sunlight, 80,000 people had showed up to watch us play our first game. And I remember walking to the center circle and looking around and going, where are you, Jamie Trecker, right now? <laughs> huh? If we listened to you, we wouldn't have done any of this. And the cool thing about it is you don't even realize the feeling until you get to the other side. I don't know if you've seen this video, but this is a 10-year-old who's at the top of a ski jump in Utah. It's one of my favorite videos. Fine. Fine. I'll do it. Well. Here goes something, I guess. Oh. Do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. You got it. Whoa, my ski's slipping off. Just remember, never snowplow, okay? 
No snow house. Just keep it straight and you'll be fine. Do okay. You do on the 20. Straight. Do you go faster on the in run? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Is it any steeper, do you think? Not same, much. Same steepness, it's just longer. Well, just longer. Just longer. Just a bigger 20, that's all. Yep. Have it's fun. A bigger 20. Go ahead. You got this. I got it. Okay. Here. The longer you wait, you'll be more scared. I go. <laughs> the first time freaks you out. That's the only thing, it's so fun! Huh? 60 seems like nothing now. Whoa! 60 seems like nothing now. Do you know what she's referring to? She was on the 20 jump, right? And she was saying like she's nervous about the 20. Now, because she's been through it, 60 seems like nothing now. I'm going after that big jump. Right? And you also notice, I mean, she's at the top, about to like hyperventilate cry. Here I go. Did you, did you hear what her dad told her at the top? Could you hear that? He said, don't slow down. Whatever you do, do not snowplow. You go for it. I love that. I love that. And here's the thing. I, I wish there was a secret sauce to getting out of that comfort zone and there isn't but there are two things going back to that uncomfortable part that help and here are the two things one of them is own your awesome this is so important because i think at a young age it's really hard for us and i and i love that you know everything we teach and i know darlington teaches this is is respect and humility and all these wonderful traits right but i feel sometimes like lost in that and especially, I will say this for girls again, lost in that is our ability to say, you know what, I'm, I'm pretty darn good at this, though. And it doesn't mean like you walk around, you know, campus here with an I am awesome, I'm owning my awesome t-shirt, right? But being able to, when you're not comfortable, go, that's okay, I'm still going to raise my hand and choose to lead and choose to get out of my comfort zone. And I, I think... So many of us, and even as adults, but definitely in high school and in college, so many of us, we get to a situation in our life, and unless we're 100% confident, what do we do? We step back, right? When in your life are you going to be 100% confident about anything? And the key is learning that I can be 30% confident. I could really not be even that confident. I could not know that job, but I'm going to give it a try, and I'm going to raise my hand. And that is something that I, I, I treasure in people. When I see people that are willing to go, hey, I don't know how to do that yet. Not I can't do it. I don't know how to do that yet. Teach me how to do that. Show me. Because you all have the skill sets to learn anything, right? Show me how to do it. But raise your hand. Own your awesome. You will be able to do it, I guarantee it. And you will be doing that on the other side, saying, the 60 seems like nothing now. You find out you're not just surviving, you're actually thriving. The other part of that is building a positive team around you. I had built in with my U.S. teammates, I had these amazing women who I told you, every day, if we doubted that we could get something done, there was someone on the team that would say, come on, stop thinking that way, we're fine. You'll be fine. Who in your life around you says you're going to be fine? Because you're going to doubt and there are going to be setbacks because that's life. And you're going to fail a test. You're not going to get into the college you wanted to. You're uh, maybe not going to do well in a game. But who in your life goes, that's okay. Learn from it and grow. Because unless you're falling and failing, you're not growing. And that was another thing I learned from these amazing women around me. We loved for someone to challenge us. They'd be like, you can't do that. And all of a sudden, everyone's eyes would light up. Like, Did they just say we couldn't? 
What? Sharpen our elbows, let's go. Right? Bring it. And know that you can, but create the group around you. How many of you have had Debbie Downers in your life, right? That friend or that family member that's like, oh, that's a great idea. Whatever. You can't do that. That's silly. Stupid. You're never going to do that. Do not listen to those people. And get them out of your circle. Surround yourself with people that are going to help you grow, believe in your dreams, and help you take on the impossible. You're in charge of that. You're in charge of who you surround yourself with. So build your team. That is one of the most important things. The other most important thing is going back to this one. Leadership is personal, not positional. Leadership, think about that, is personal, not positional. You don't have to have a Twitter following of 5 million You don't have to have an Instagram following of 2 million. You don't have to be a superstar. You don't have to have a microphone. You don't have to have an Olympic gold medal. You just have to care about something enough that you raise your hand and get out of your comfort zone and say, I care enough that I'm going to go do that. Right? Quickly, because I know we're running out of time. No, actually, I don't have time for that. Sorry, I'll get to it next time. But no, you can. I think the biggest misconception And mistake young kids make is they think, ah, I can't do that. I'm not a superstar. I'm not a celebrity. I can't attract it. There's so many things you could do. It's not always giving of money. It's giving of your time and your talent. They need people to volunteer. They need people to help. I know you guys get out into your community. Do those types of things. Give of your talent. You could read. You have eyes to a senior that may be an older individual who can't read, who's lost his eyesight. All these wonderful things you can do. But most important is this one, to be rather than to seem. You have to be you. Not trying to be someone else, but leadership is authentically, courageously you. That's the most important thing. Find what your style is. I couldn't be Mia. Mia couldn't be me. I couldn't be Carla Overbeck, one of the best leaders we had on our national team. But gosh, I could sure watch her and learn from her. But at the end of the day, I had to be me. Because that's what's genuine. That's what people want to follow. And when you're genuine and it's natural, that's much more appealing to people. They're going to want to follow that because you care about something and it's coming from the heart. It's not someone you're trying to be. You're not imitating someone else. To be rather than to seem. I love that one. Attitudes are contagious. Is yours worth catching? Attitudes are contagious. Is yours worth catching? Think about that, because regardless of your role on any team, any group you're in, any class you're in, if things are going down, how do you react? Because that affects everyone on your team. Are you the person that, like, if something goes wrong, it's like head down, shoulders down, here we go. How does that body language make you feel? Does that make you feel, like, fired up? Not really, right? Or are you the person on the team in the middle of chaos that goes, We're going to be fine, even if you're not feeling it. You can fake it. We call it fake it till you make it all the time, even if you're not feeling it. Fake it till you make it. We're fine. I have no idea if we're fine, but just say it. We are fine. And if you can't get that right, then you can have some perspective. Some of this is one of the favorite videos I have is the perspective of a guy trying to play baseball. Check this out real quick. Oh, I love that one. I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. 
it, it really is, though, one of the most cherished skill sets I have in leadership is in times of crisis, because it's, it's easy to be a good leader when everything's going well or you're winning or you're scoring goals or whatever's happening in your forum. But what happens when things aren't going well, right? And you find quickly the best leaders are the ones in the middle of the panic who really do keep that calm. And it is not easy, right? Because there are crazy butterflies flowing or you're not feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm not sure we can get this done. Dr. Colleen Hacker, who used to work with our national team, she told me one of the best pieces of advice ever. I said, before game, I'm getting all these butterflies and I'm nervous and I don't know what to do about them. And they're driving me crazy because I'm thinking about it all the time. So then I go into a game and I feel like it's a sign of insecurity or lack of confidence. And then I'm thinking about that and I'm spiraling down, 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 right? Because one thought leads to the next. And she goes, butterflies are a great thing. And I said, why? She goes, one, they mean you care. And that's a great thing. You care about this game. You care about the outcome. Now just teach them to fly in formation. I was like, heck yes! How do you do that? But it's so true. If you feel that, you get to control what the outcome is, right? Teach them to fly in formation. I used to wear this in, when I would play soccer. It was a, around my wrist. I would snap it every time like a bad thought went into my head. I would snap it. It was like a physical motion to snap me out of that mental state. And it worked. It was like, boom, get, out of, get it out. Replace it with a positive. And it worked. Again, you control that. And that's the really cool thing in all of this leadership stuff is you get to control all these people you could inspire. And it becomes this wonderful cycle of inspiring and being inspired. And it's the beautiful thing because it doesn't just happen by chance. I go back to that first quote. Leadership isn't a matter of chance. It's a matter of choice. You guys get to decide. That's the really cool thing. Every day you wake up, you get to decide what you want to do. Choose wisely, own your awesome, and know you can choose to matter. That's the most important thing. Thank you for letting me speak to you guys today. I appreciate it.